So I've got, I've got to get into this decision-making, then we'll do the surgery. There's a kind of disease, you said, that so when we're supposed to make a, a risk-averse decision, we make a risk-prone decision. Well, how does that work? What happens? When you have too much dopamine. Yeah. When you have too much dopamine in your brain, compared to the normal, yeah. then you are not risk-averse, you, you tend to take risk. You tend to gamble, you take to take... So uh, gambling is a physiological? Gambling is a physiological disorder. And we know it because sometimes when we treat our patient with Parkinson's disease, with dopamine replacement therapy, we induce gambling behavior in our patient. Really? Okay. I didn't yes. know that either. Uh, oh. so, so all these diseases that are, we can characterize by too much dopamine in the brain. Again, and of course, this is a first order yeah. approximation. Right. There are other systems, but all these diseases that are characterized by too much dopamine in the brain will take you to risk, risky behavior. Gambling, hypersexuality, uh, hypermanic behavior, everything that can be related. And we do see it in our patient, sometimes as part of our treatment. And of course, we have then to come back with the treatment to adjust it. I see. So in, in, in all kinds of fields, sex, you have too much, you're doing all kinds of risks. Intersexuality is one of the problems that we can push our patient into it. And of well, course, we, we should find out if a certain golf player had too much dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. I believe so. <laughs> uh, He's a very good golf player. So. <laughs> maybe that's related and there's a connection. Yeah, and maybe, you know, these top CEOs who, who blew all the money in the last zoo, <laughs> maybe they had too much dopamine in their brain, and that made for their success, but also for the failure. Actually, we're coming back to one of the ethical questions that people are now speaking to, but said, I'm not responsible for my action, this is my brain. Yeah. But this is, I'm coming back to it, no, your brain is yourself. Yeah. Your brain is what you have created in it, and therefore it is your responsibility. Yeah, because you reinforce certain things exactly. that reinforce more exactly. dopamine, etc. Exactly. And it carries you in a certain direction. Now, you also think that this procedure is not only applicable to Parkinson's, but other diseases. Why is that the case? Because, again, the procedure is as we do now, the deep brain stimulation, we put electrode into some place in the brain, and as, as it's now, we are putting the stimulator working for all the time. What we've done in the lab is to, I think, to move to the next generation of this kind of procedure, and we use closed loop technique or adaptive technique. We identify the abnormal activity in the brain, and when there is abnormal activity, we react to the abnormal activity by giving current. So we create a closed loop system which identify the abnormal activity in the Parkinsonian monkey, close the loop, and inject current in order to overcome only the abnormal activity. We have done this trick many, many times in the, in the past, in the cardiac pacemaker, okay? So cardiac pacemaker are already adaptive pacemaker. We identify when there is something wrong, and only then react. So now we have, at least in the monkey, adaptive pacemaker for the, for the Parkinson disease. If this work out, then we can move to other disease. Before we move to the other disease, I'd like to show that two minute film clip in which it, it's quite dramatic, shows the effect of this treatment on Parkinson's. So let's watch that now. Chagai, that's very dramatic. But you suggest that this could be applied to schizophrenia and even depression? Depression, actually, we are already in the first step. So there are already 
several patients all over the world that have been operated for depression, for depression that is refractory for medical treatment and even for electroconvulsive therapy. So of course, if we can treat our patient with major depression, with Prozac or other kind of pharmacological treatment, go for it. Don't go for neurosurgery. Right. But 30 to 40 percent of the patient are not responder, are not responsive to pharmacological treatment and not even to, to ECT, to electroconvulsive therapy. For this patient with major depression, refractory major depression, actually there are already ongoing experiment in the world that are offering them the brain stimulation. From my point of view, what we should do in the near future is to have animal model for depression and for schizophrenia. And we have first step into having animal model, monkey model, for schizophrenia. This is used by uh, ketamine, which is animal antagonist. And we have our reason to say that this is a good animal model for schizophrenia, as we had the MPTP neurotoxin model for Parkinson's disease. And if we can now identify the abnormal activity in the brain of animal with depression or animal with schizophrenia, we can try to use the same trick, closed loop, whenever there is abnormal activity, react and stimulate. And if this will work in monkey, maybe we can come, come back to society and say, we have a proof of concept. Let's go very, very carefully and let's find this young patient that have already two episodes of psychosis of schizophrenia. And we know that probably they will have one and one episode after the other, and they will decline to an hostel or to be, uh, the to streets, be in the street. The, yeah, they and, and with all the, again, one should very, very careful. We have all this terrible history of psychosurgery yeah. that we know about it, but the nice feature of deep brain stimulation and adaptive deep brain stimulation is that we can switch it. It is reversible. Well, and describe your surgery, because uh, people can't envision what you do. Why don't you just take a minute and describe what you actually so, do? So, it is very long surgery, but to make a long story short, we start by imaging. We know, how, find our target in the brain of the specific patient. Then, while the patient is awake, with local anesthetic, we are making a small hole in the skull, putting electrode, localizing the target, which is about 80 millimeter below the skull, then put a chronic electrode that is going up to the target and connect it to the skull, and then taking it under the skin to the pacemaker, which is located in the chest. All over it take about six to eight hours, okay? So I've done it a very, very short uh, introduction very to, <laughs> to, to, to the surgery. But uh, again, this kind of surgery has been done for more than 50,000 patients with Parkinson's disease all over the world. And the success rate? The success rate is huge. It is more than 90%. Phenomenal. And uh, that's, I gather one of your compatriots in this is in Toronto? Yes. Yeah, so, so we are collaborating. There is a very, very good group, the group of prof Professor Andreas Lozano in the Toronto Hospital of University of Toronto. And uh, is, we are working together for many, many years. It is small farm. The world is getting smaller and smaller. And, uh, uh, and uh, Again, he's doing this kind of surgery in Toronto. We are doing this kind of surgery in Jerusalem. People are doing it in United States, Europe, Japan, all over the world. And we With are very happy. phenomenal success. Uh, it's all great. I want to relate it to another thing. I, I understand you're a marathon runner. From time to time, you're right. <laughs> and you're going to run a marathon with your doctor, uh, your daughter who's studying for medicine. No, no, no. I, I've run a marathon with my two sons, and now I'm going to run 
in October I'm going to run a marathon with my daughter that is finishing high school. Oh, high, and high before school. she's going to the army. I see. So now we are in the middle of training for this marathon. Is there a the connection team. between your marathon running, you're running 42 kilometers, and your science? Because it's like a marathon. Well, it is 40 kilometer, 195 meters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to keep with this 195 meters. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> If you run a marathon, you feel them at the end. I don't know. I think that uh, there is w one small connection. For, for, first of all, I think it is a kind that for me and for, for, mo for most of us, we understand that doing physical activity is good for your brain. Okay? So I understand it. I enjoy it. And I think that this is something that I would recommend everybody, including our, my patient. Okay? Do physical activity. If to do a marathon, again, for me, it is, it is, it is uh, something that is, is a challenge. It is uh, maybe, as you mentioned, the, the Israeli risk <laughs> seeking <laughs> behavior, but uh, I enjoy it. <laughs> well, with that, I want to thank you for a wonderful, very interesting interview. Thank you. Thank you very much.